Hello. A little while ago, I demonstrated how a thermal imaging camera could be useful for detecting certain kinds of faults on circuit boards. And it was a great piece of kit for doing that sort of thing. But the bit of a limitation of that particular one is it's thermal imaging only. Uh, some uh, thermal imaging cameras also include an optical overlay, and that can be very useful. And they're starting to become a little bit more affordable these days. Special delivery. Ooh, I wonder what's in this. Let's have a look at this thermal imaging camera. Scott, would you like to help me do some of the uh, experiments with this like you did last time? Yeah, sure. Okay, we'll do that later. Now, last time I demonstrated fault finding on a PCB which had a short circuit diode on it that was uh, dumping all the current from the 5 volt line. But, of course, in a case of a faulty component like that, it isn't a perfect dead short, so it has some resistance and will generate some heat. This is potentially a more challenging fault that I've put onto this board, because in this case, we have a 5 volt line with a whisker of wire going across 5 volt to ground. And of course, that does genuinely happen. You can get solder whiskers uh, or short circuits between pins where you have a pretty much zero ohm uh, short across a power rail. So that might be a little bit harder to find with a thermal imaging camera. Let's give that a shot shortly. Right, start by unboxing this new thermal imaging camera. So this is a KTI W01 thermal imaging camera from Kai Wheats. And quick look at the back. Uh, we see we've got a protective cover, that's nice. A separate visible camera, but you need to be slightly aware that it's not uh, coaxial with the thermal one. So if you're looking at something that's very close, you may get a small parallax hour. So we will look at that. Uh, image capture button, sort of trigger. Uh, it takes battery, uh, keyboard and display, as you'd expect. Right, let's uh, have a look inside. Nicely designed box, it's a magnetic catch on it. Okay, in the top here we have user manual. We're certainly going to be uh, referring to that uh, in multiple languages, but uh, 28 pages of English. And a very nice carry case. And the uh, unit itself, which is going to need charging up. We also have a zip bag here for storing accessories such as the user manual. Okay, so there's our optical and thermal cameras and a cover for them. Resolution 192 by 256 display and the temperature ranges from minus 20 through to 550 Celsius. Uh, that's quite high and that could be useful for even uh, our over soldering iron that overheats. Uh, oh, this is where the battery resides. Oh, I do like that. So it's an easy to change battery. If we need to change that, we can take that out and I think it's got wiring on it. Yes, so you could uh, replace that without having to strip down the whole unit. That's a nice, nice touch. Here's USB-C charging port. Right, I think we'll charge it before we use it. Okay, this one has a European plug. Uh, is there an option for a UK plug? Let's have a look at the box again. Okay, so when you buy them in the UK normally, I'm sure that will come with a UK plug. Minor problem. Nice thick cable that. You can feel that's quality. So the charger included is 5 volt 2 amp. I'm going to be using a somewhat older, slower charger because I don't have an adapter for that one, just to hand. Okay, that's good. It tells you when it's charging and I'll just leave that to charge for a while and we'll come back and play with it shortly. So we have the uh, user manual here, but it's also available online. Uh, it has to be said, there are some sort of translation weaknesses in the manual, and maybe that's something they can improve later. For example, page 15, uh, when connecting with the computer, pull the data line after selecting pop out device safely. So what it's trying to say is uh, you use the Windows uh, eject this disk rather than just pull the cable out. Otherwise, you could uh, corrupt the data. And if you do corrupt it, you know, that's that's normal. That would happen on the USB stick as well. Uh, if you have unable to save or other problems, you uh, may find the hard disk in the computer and fix it, which is to say you can see it in the drive and allow it to plug it in. It sees it as a drive and allow it to scan and fix the, the, the data on the, or the formatting on the internal memory. So what they've said is correct, but the way it's said isn't terribly good. Right, there is some built-in software uh, and 
conveniently enough, they store a copy on the internal memory. I'm sure you'll be able to update it as well uh, online, but uh, it's a great way to get started. So we'll plug this USB cable into the computer and uh, get that software started. So that's plugged in. Does anything happen until we switch this on? Possibly not. So switch this on. So it has a boot sequence. There's a bit of clicking. This is quite normal, it seems, for thermal imaging cameras. Uh, the lid is closed at the moment, so we'll open that. The first thing I want to do, though, before we start uh, using this much, is see if we can get to that uh, USB drive. So, connect the product with the USB cable, connect to the computer, and open removable disk on the computer and find the installation package folder. Um, I can't find that removable disk. What's happened? Ah, I'll plug it into a different port and it worked for reasons. Well, it's being detected now, but not seeing it as a drive yet. All right, at the moment, I just can't get the USB link to work for reasons unknown, so we'll have to revisit that later. Let's uh, just try the actual machine first, come back to that problem later. OK, having switched it on, we can see some obvious things straight away, is that we're being shown the uh, temperature at the centre point there, and the coldest point there, and the maximum is 34 in this particular environment, so everything here is pretty uniform. And we can step between uh, visible camera, I mean, it's only low resolution visible camera, it only helps you to sort of line up, and uh, thermal and a mix of both. So that can be very handy, obviously. You'd want to, you'd want to have a mix of both in many applications where thermal alone doesn't you know, let you see uh, enough uh, detail. It depends what you're recording, of course, but sometimes you've got something that's either very repetitive or very far away or very uniform. It can be hard to see uh, where you are on that image, uh, so you really need the optical view as well. So it's great to be able to overlay them, and you can. So there we have a pure thermal image, and we're looking at this screen. Uh, you can't see anything really but the heat from the backlights uh, on the the screen. Uh, but here we can see a pure optical and then we can mix them together so we have different ratios of the, the thermal and uh, optical image. Okay, very useful. Now, we're going to have a look at this circuit board here. This is the one that I've put a, a short circuit uh, whisker across a 5 volt line uh, and we're going to run it on a power supply that will give us about 2 amps uh, through the whole system and we can see, hopefully, some of the tracks heating up and maybe even identify where that short circuit whisker is. Let's have a look. Okay, I'm going to set my power supply here to, uh, it should be about five volts if it's off load. There we go. But it's on load and we'll set the current limit all the way up to about two amps. So now we've got two amps on this circuit board and we're going to look for some heat. I'll get my fingers out of the way and let's see if we can work out where the, uh, the short circuit is. You can see quite a lot of heat going up the top there. I think we're going to learn more if we look at the other side of the board. So let's do that. Well, it's now upside down so the heat's going to be at the bottom. Okay, we have a misalignment between the optical and the thermal here because you can read that writing and yet the circuit board is um, heating up there. So that we need to fix. You can adjust that in a menu later. What I'm going to do for now is go to thermal only. Right. So we can see a lot of heat on the left hand side here, which is where the connectors are for the power supply and then we can see the 5 volt rails getting hotter and hotter and we really are zoning in down here you can see a lot of heat at the bottom there 
Right, so press and hold the trigger button. It says, do I want to start recording? I say, enter. And I'm not sure how you can see it's recording. Oh yes, there we are. There's a counter going. Of course, we're working it sideways. Right, so now we can see uh, an overlay optical. We're probably too close, really. So let's look at uh, thermal only. Now that's thermal only. And then that's overlay. And that's optical only. If you get too close to the subject, the parallax error gets worse. So, of course, there's a distance between these two. And if you do get too close, that parallax error starts to really make a difference. If I go to thermal only, I'm just wondering if I can point with my finger to where it appears to be hottest. Appears about there. And if we look at the other side of the board, do we have a hot component? Yes, there's a very hot diode there next to the capacitor. We are stressing that diode. But in fact, everything's getting hot, even the wires even the wires, which aren't really rated for this sort of current, are starting to get quite warm. I can actually feel heat in those at 2 amps. You would, from this, conclude that that diode is short circuit, and it might well be now, but actually that is not the short circuit that I've added to this board. Um, I'll show you the actual short circuit. Let's uh, stop using the thermal imaging camera for a moment and look at the actual situation we're working on. I'll switch off the uh, power supply. So we've been looking at this board and this diode here has been getting very hot. That's underneath these power resistors. But that's not the short circuit. That's been taking way more current than it's designed for. The actual short circuit is a whisker of copper here. I'll let you see that under a microscope is that little whisker of copper there. So would we have found that uh, just by looking at the thermal profile of this board? Well, there's our diode there, which has been getting really hot and bothered. And that is connected with just a few just by just a few millimeters away from our short circuit. So I think once we've probably gone down uh, a rabbit hole of wondering why the diode had gone short circuit, we, I think, would have at that point probably spotted that there's a short circuit there. So, though it may not give you the actual component that's failed, uh, using thermal imaging techniques when you're facing a short circuit, uh, it can very much point you in the right direction. Let's remove that short circuit and see how the board responds. Right, that's our circuit, uh, short circuit removed. Uh, let's see what happens when we pair this up now. So the thermal imaging camera really did help us to zone in on where that short circuit was, even though it didn't point directly to the short circuit, because of course that has essentially no resistance. So it's going to be whichever component does have some resistance that's nearby in the circuit that starts to get hot. Uh, so it's good for short circuit fault finding to a point. Well, I'd mentioned before about the distance between the uh, optical and thermal cameras here. And at a great distance, anything beyond a few metres, you can set this up so that the uh, images for those two line up. And then any greater distance, it really won't make any difference. But when you're close up, the distance here is going to mount up. And you'll get a error uh, in the alignment of the two images, for which there is an adjustment. So here I'm looking at something, I'll zoom you in. So you can see we have a resistor against a plain black background. That's pure optical and that's pure thermal. But when you have some mix, 
you can see that the heat from the resistor is not lined up with the optical image. So menu, enter. You know, with arrows pointing that way, you'd imagine that pressing the right button would have the same effect as enter, but it doesn't. It ignores that. So you have to press enter and then you're in the uh, alignment adjustment and the alignment moves the optical. It leaves the thermal where it is. Right, so we have arrows now to allow us to move the optical. Ah, it times out pretty quickly. You have to be pretty sharp about it. Right, now I can line them up, hopefully. There we go. And now it will just time out in a few moments. And now you can see that we have the optical and uh, thermal images lined up beautifully, but that's for this distance. So now if I get closer, they'll move, you see? And further away, again, they'll move in the other direction. Okay, so you can do that adjustment on this unit, but you can't do it with any images that you've captured, of course. Once you've captured the image, it's too late. So if you capture that to computer or you take a photograph of it, it's too late for you to then uh, alter the location of the two. So you kind of need to uh, set that up before you grab any images or video files. OK, I had a spot of bother connecting it to my computer with the uh, supplied cable, and I suspect the cable is faulty. Even though it feels really good quality, I think we may have just had a bad one. But bear in mind, this is possibly a bit of a pre-production prototype, so let's not uh, worry too much about that. Um, anyway, I have some alternative USB-C cables, uh, so I connected that to a PC downstairs, got that working, and went to install the software that comes on it, and I got a virus uh, warning from the computer, and I plugged it into another machine and had a virus warning on that too, and that was using different antivirus software. False positives, possibly, but um, anyway, uh, I have now got uh, a, a later version of the software uh, downloaded from the manufacturer from Kiwitz. So we'll use that software uh, and load it on this machine and have a look. Okay, so here's our new software and uh, we'll just use uh, Microsoft Defender. Quick check on that. No threats found. So whatever was happening, I think it was just a, a transitory problem with that particular installation. There's a readme.txt. Should we look at that? Uh, oh, let's translate that. Okay, that's just the version numbers. So we'll uh, install the software here. We'll have to put up with uh, United States American. Okay, we've uh, started the uh, IR Image Tools software. So let's open a JPEG and we can open one that's uh, still on the uh, Kyrites unit or one that you've copied locally. And let's have a look at the one with a resistor in it. But this is so much more than just a JPEG. For a start, we can change the blend here between pure optical, it's low resolution but it's fine, and pure thermal. So you can set the ratio you want here, which is better than just trying to do it on the uh, the handset itself if you're trying to make a, you know, a presentation, you're trying to make a file that you can use. And furthermore, you can pick out temperatures that are not listed here. So, okay, it's got some results here of the minimum and maximum and emissivity values it, it assumed during the recording or the photograph. But we can do more. For example, if we want to look at uh, some temperatures of, say, these crocodile clips, we can draw some various different shapes here and it'll give you maximum and minimum readings within that shape. If you think, oh, I got that wrong, just delete it here. Do it a different way if you want them on a straight line. So you can do further analysis like this uh, after the event, which you wouldn't have been able to do uh, necessarily on the machine at the time. So very useful that. And any one of those that you get wrong and you need to delete, you can just go ahead and delete them. 
when you have uh, you know you've, you've collected your extra information and you've got these extra readings on here and the uh, ratio you want of optical to thermal you can then save this as a normal JPEG but you can't reopen that again in the software that's a JPEG only so that's what the software does for us and it's uh, pretty useful I think that software then will allow you to access stills, but only stills, that are recorded on this, and it sees it as a USB device. Uh, now, I do know that the software on some other thermal imaging cameras can do a bit more than that, in that it can then treat the uh, thermal imaging camera as a camera, not just as a, a storage device, and you can put video directly onto the computer uh, in real time. So that's something that this software can't do. Let me mention something briefly about the uh, menus on here. If you step down through the menu and then you want to select one of the items, you'd expect the right arrow to activate that menu, but it doesn't. You have to press the enter. And I think that would be a nice update in the firmware for them to make it so the right arrow is also acceptable because otherwise you tend to miss the function you're looking for. Let's go through some of these settings and have a look uh, you see, I just pressed that button and it didn't do anything. Uh, let's go to the uh, range. You can alter the temperature range. So I'm interested here in that one. Don't press that button, press that one. And we can go two temperature ranges, minus 20 to plus 120 Celsius, or 120 Celsius to 550, which is very high. But what happens if you're sort of in the middle? So let's have a look at uh, a unit I'm going to set here for around about 120 Celsius and see if we can go a little over 120 on the low range and a little under it on the high range. Let's see what happens. So I have a hot air system here and I'm going to control that around about the 120 something Celsius and see what happens. So we're presently in the low temperature setting Okay, so at the highest temperature point there, it's saying over. I'll take a photo of that. So let's lower the temperature and see if we can get it to, say, about 110 I'm requesting. And the max is still over, it says. Okay, so the maximum now, I'm requesting 100 out of the uh, hot air gun, but it could be hotter than that. So it's reading about 100 and... 20 or thereabouts and falling very slightly so let's push it up to just over 120 reading on here gone up to 105 requested it's reading around about 120 let's go a little higher requesting 110 right so much over about 122 degrees on there and it just reads over okay let's change the range then which I would argue is one layer deeper than it should be on the menu system. Now it's reading a maximum of 127, something like that. And the minimum it's saying is over. What it means is over range or out of range. Really, it should say minimum is under. And I've already written to Kybeats about this, and they're going to see if that can be adjusted in a future firmware update. Right, now let's take this temperature down so it will be just under 120. So I'm requesting 100. Max is about 120. I think I've hit the minimum of what my hot air gun will do at 100. Right, and now it's saying max over, min over. Which is kind of, you know, a little bit meaningless. So we're in the higher range and we're right on the edge of whether it'll start reading. So I think really there needs to be an overlap between the high and low ranges because if you're like here trying to measure something that is around about 120 Celsius uh, you kind of can't get a range that will read around that area in any meaningful way and under some circumstances that could be a bit of a showstopper you might be able, not be able to do your work at all. So I have another experiment to try with this. I'm working on my 1972 Hillman Avenger. I've done a video about that in the past. It's got some lines on the heated rear window that don't work at all, and some that work with hot spots. I can tell there are hot spots because when the window is misty and the heated rear window is on, 
those spots get particularly hot and clear more quickly than the rest of the line. So I want to apply some conductive paint on those spots to get the whole line to work properly. But of course, it's never convenient to try to find those hot spots with mist. So that's where this is going to come in really handy. Uh, now, one of my problems here, I kind of need to hold this steady. Why don't you use a tripod? Ah, now there's a point. Uh, this particular thermal imaging camera does not have a tripod mount. Uh, that's something that the other one I tested does have. So in some applications, that could be better. In this particular case, I'm going to be working it sideways. And yes, if you had a tripod mount at the bottom, uh, you could set up a tripod to do that, but it's not easy. The therm we've got the thermal and optical shot uh, views there. So what I'm gonna do is put the ignition on and put the heated rear window on. So I now have the heated rear window on. It's been on for a couple of minutes and we should be able to see some spots are particularly bright but i think we're getting a little confused by incoming light from outside so i'll um, close the garage door and it should be a uniform brightness behind it okay so now i think we can see one hot spot there and if I mix it with the optical, I should be able to find it. Although I haven't done my alignment, so that could uh, make for an invalid uh, mix. I haven't aligned the optical and thermal yet. Uh, let's take some photos of that. I've got one very bright hot spot there. I'll take a photo of that. So that's clearly a place that I need to apply some of the conductive paint. Oh look, and some more hot spots there, which we can see further up. So again, what I'll do uh, later is get an assistant to point to the hot spots and um, put something like a, a marker or a bit of sticky tape or something so I know where they are. So this is a really good way of finding uh, high resistance segments on the heated rear window. Something I'd like to look at now is this uh, rechargeable soldering iron from Lidl. And Big Clive has done an item about this, uh, done a video about this, because these get way too hot and there is a way to reconfigure it to uh, set the temperature down a bit. So let's see how hot it is. Um, you know, my normal soldering iron is about 360 Celsius. Let's see how hot this one gets. I also wanted to show you the uh, boot time on this thing and compare it actually to a different one. So we'll do that at the same time while this is warming up. So let's just, uh, while we're waiting for that to warm up, switch on both of these units and see how long they take to boot. Right, so the high wheats one is quite a lot quicker to switch on than the uh, top down model. So both of these units are going to have to be set in the high temperature mode in order to work uh, with the high temperature that we're going to be getting from this soldering iron. And we'll see here that the uh, top down model is saying that the max temperature is uh, about 480 Celsius, something like that, and the Kyrie's one is probably saying similar things. 480 Celsius. Let's take a photograph. In comparing these, one of the things that's immediately obvious is that the top down one is a much closer image. It's like it has more magnification on it, and the Kyrie's one is more um, zoomed out which suits your particular application will vary on you know what you're doing uh, it might be that you need to be looking at something smaller or you need to have a, a wider field of view so uh, you wouldn't say one is better than the other they're just different right my assistant Scott's going to help us uh, do some shots here uh, do you fancy a nice cold drink Scott 
Let's take some photos of that or get some shots of that. I have to hold this down, don't I? Yeah. The way you power it up, as you would have seen me do earlier, you press and hold it for a few seconds and then let go and it'll boot. So I'll take some pictures of this then. Oh. Uh, right. When you do that, you then press the enter button to yeah. store the photo. Now, I've tried not to do too much direct comparison between the Kyrites and the Top Tom TC004, not least because this is an older model TC004 and I believe the new version uh, of this, any one you'd buy now, is slightly different. But one thing I think it'd be nice to do is take a comparison photo of a subject like this, a cold glass of, water, uh, of drink. Can you take it from the same distance, Scott? Oh, I'll try. Now, another thing I'd like to do, if we can, is to take some movies on both of them. Uh, so if you'd like to just... Uh, tell you what, if we hold them together, I think you press and hold the trigger button on both of them. So we'll, we'll see if we can get some movies of both. Uh, one of them is, right, okay, the Kyrie's is saying start recording yes or no, and I'll say this yes. This one has already started recording. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, top don just went ahead and recorded. So let's move around and see how they respond. Something that's not going to come across very well on the video is that, uh, and I'll see if I can demonstrate it here for you, if you'll be able to see the screens is that when I move them, I, I don't know if you can see that, but the image is delayed on the top dom. Do you have a look, Scott? When I move them, the top dom, the blue one, I think the image is taking longer to catch up. It is, isn't it? It is, yeah. So that's not a, uh, it's not so much refresh, because it looks like the refresh is similar on both. They both have a reasonably smooth image, but the top down seems to be slower to respond to the change. Can you uh, have a look at something that's a bit warmer? You'd found some uh, lighting earlier, hadn't you? Yeah, down, down here. Okay, we've got LED lighting under the cabinets. Actually, I've done a YouTube video about that. Uh, would you like to get quite close to that and see Okay, yep, I'll take a right. photo um, of Should I do that on that one as well? Okay. I think the, the results are very similar, aren't they, actually? This one you have to push down a lot more. Oh, I've started recording. Yeah. No. no. What other differences have we found? Uh, so on the top down one, we have noticed that you have the function to make it do alarms when it goes over a certain temperature. Under or over, I think. Under or over a certain temperature that you, that you want in case it was to prevent something dangerous from happening. Whereas on the Kai Wheats one, uh, it doesn't have that functionality. Right, but were the alarms useful? The uh, not really, because they don't produce any audio. You right. cannot actually tell that they're going off necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a little bit limited. What I would like them to do, uh, could be done with either of these models, is if a uh, temperature goes out of specification, for it to be able to signal via the USB cable so a computer at the other end can respond to that. And it could simply sig signal by sending out a file called alarmsomething.jpg, and then you could have software just monitoring for that, say, oh look, there's an alarm raised. And that would be very useful, especially in industrial control applications, where you want to be able to see if something goes out of specification. So what else have we found? On this model of the top down, it does not have um, an optical camera. So you right. cannot switch between optical and thermal There is a version layers. of this that does. There's the a, there is a version that does. However, on this one, the Kai Wheat the one, it does have uh, it does have the option to switch between thermal and optical. And it's a, do you think that's a really important feature? I think it's really important. It makes it much easier to see what's going on and it allows you to have different layers as well, which I really like. It's not like on and off. Mm -hmm. And tell you what, uh, I haven't shown you yet, but in the software, 
you can alter that mix continuously actually because I think there's like four layers, four levels of mix on here but on the PC software you can alter the mix to any amount you want. Yeah. Really good because the way it stores the optical and thermal images as two different components within the JPEG file. Um, but what do you think about the alignment issues we've had as we get closer and further away? Um, it, it is... <coughs> sorry. I think the... It's, firstly, it's very difficult to set the alignment, I feel, because you can go into the menus and do it, but it takes a while to kind of like to align because you have to manually do it. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, a maximum and minimum that you can do it to. When we got something too close, you had your hand in front of it, we couldn't, we couldn't fully get the alignment straight, could we? Yeah, so that, that becomes an issue if you want to look at something very close. And, and especially if the item in question is not stationary, it's moving yeah. closer and further away. Yeah, it becomes very difficult. What about when you have it on the software? Could you align on it On the there? PC? Um, no. Even though, like I was saying, there are two layers of that JPEG of thermal and optical, and you can change the mix, it doesn't seem possible to make a realignment. Why don't you just take the 100% uh, thermal image and the 100% mm -hmm. optical image? Yeah, you and can then, save both of those, yeah. And then use PaintShop Pro to, to combine them. And realign them. Realign them. Yeah, do you know, that's almost perfect. But you know the markers it puts in for the temperatures? They are burnt onto both images. So you'd finish up with two lots of markers out of alignment. So yeah, it almost works, but not quite. So really they would need to be able to do that in a software update. And maybe Kyrites can do that in the future. Make a small change to the PC software that allows you to realign the uh, optical and thermal uh, images. So is there another shot you want to take? Uh, yes, I'd like to take um, just, an, just a, a picture of a single ice cube and compare the two images between the two Right, cameras. okay, right, yeah. <laughs> Samsung? Right, okay then. Well, it's not one ice cube, it's not several. One, but okay. Right, okay. So do you think there's a difference between those two images? Uh, yes, when you look at it on the top done one, you can see the surrounding area of the ice cube uh, is also colder as you colder, yeah. Colder, yeah, as you'd expect it to be. However, on the Kai Wheats one, it instead you can only really see the ice cubes themselves being cold, and the surrounding area doesn't seem to be affected much. So I think what's going on there is it's something to do with the uh, range of temperatures uh, and the way it's displaying the range. Uh, so the top dom one. I think is being able to show the cold air around the ice cubes, uh, whereas the Kyrites one, I think, is covering a larger temperature range, so everything's more compressed within it, and you're losing a little bit of detail there in the uh, cold air. Although, I'm not sure how many applications that that subtle difference in temperature would be something you have to see. One thing that I, we both criticised the top DOM for way back when we tested it, and now we just realise it's all thermal imaging cameras, is that what looks hot is very scene dependent. Do you remember that? So something can look extremely hot in one scene, but when it's compared to something much hotter, it goes down to almost ambient. So you just need to be aware as you're looking at the colours of any image that you need to look at the extremities to see what they really are uh, and not get distracted by something looking very hot or very cold when in fact it's only a few degrees away from the other uh, surrounding material. Well thank you for your help downstairs Scott. So comparing these a little more uh, a bonus on this one is it's got twice as much uh, memory storage for videos and photos to the top don but the top don does have a S micro SD card slot so you could actually increase the amount of memory. There also seem to be less lag on the videos on this one and I really like the uh, removable battery. I think that's a real bonus that you can always replace the battery easily in the future.
Uh, but I think the most important feature on this is the fact that you can use the optical camera and that you can mix the two between the thermal and optical. That is a game changer, isn't it? And when you consider that this is priced at about the same price as many uh, thermal cameras that don't have the optical uh, image as well, uh, it's uh, quite a compelling choice. If you're in the market for a thermal imaging camera, the uh, Kyrites KTI W01 should certainly be uh, on your shortlist. Uh, for the price point where it does uh, optical and thermal imaging and you love the way don't you that they mix them together uh, there's nothing quite like it now normally I do audio and video technology on my channel and I'll be doing plenty more of that shortly so I'll see you then bye, bye. for now